Again, Dr. Richard C. Miller joins me here at Myth Vision Podcast to discuss Jesus's translation fable in his book, Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity. On page 35 specifically, there's a larger sub-theme category in which several figures hundreds of years before Jesus, all the way down contemporaneous to Jesus, the Caesars, for example, and even post the time of Jesus, they were doing this in the Greek and Roman world. Christianity came out of the Greek and Roman world. Now, I know several apologists will pull the apologetic that these were staunch Jews to the point where they had nothing. They wanted to cut themselves off from a Hellenistic world, but we know that's not the case. We've gone into several reasons in different episodes. Let me read you a few of the sub-themes before we get into the interview with Dr. Miller. Heinous or ignoble injustice rectified by translation. Metamorphosis. Vanished, vanished missing body. Eponymous etiology. Catastrophism. Post-translation speech. Ascension. Post-mortem translation. Translation associated with Zeus's thunderbolt. Post-translation appearance. Translation associated with a river. Translation associated with a mountain. Odious and du or dubious alternative account. Taken up by the winds or clouds. Feigned translation. In chapter two of his book, he goes through at least a hundred, if not more, Greek or Roman figures who had missing bodies that fit some of these subcategories. And all classicists, without batting an eye, recognize, oh, they became a god. This is a translation fable of a human mortal who then becomes a god. Who else was a human mortal that ascends on high and his name is now above every name, meaning he's a higher status than he was before? Uh, a metamorphosis has taken place or an apotheosis has happened to Jesus. And when I say it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and the apologists bat their eyes and laugh it off, they're not really paying attention if they don't see what we're seeing. Dr. Miller, I gave the Romulus list at the end of our last episode, but there was even a better, I guess you'd say, signal list that even goes broader than the Romulus translation fable, which we do find parallels, very significant parallels to Jesus. But you on page 35 of Resurrection Reception talk about translation sub-themes before you get into your gallery of so many Greek and Roman heroes and, and people that become gods and various different kind of figures. And they don't all match. Well, what the heck is that about? I mean, wouldn't you expect if they're translation fables, Dr. Miller, that every one of them would check all of the boxes and just every one of them had ascension narratives. Every one of them was taken in the cloud. Like, why not? Uh, why, not why did they all have the same? Because then the Christians could just go, OK, OK, you win. But why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it really comes down to a fundamental, I think, a misapprehension. Oftentimes you find it in in a lot of different discussion about the antiquity in terms of comparisons and people, you know, parallelism, this kind of thing. These are very soft categories that don't really have a lot of strength in terms of descri describing and explaining. Um, I want to go deeper than that. I want to get into the language because at that point, the confidence rises considerably and starts to appro approach 100%, at least in terms of human cognition. And so this is, this is a cognitive approach. How do people recognize a certain story as a certain kind of story? And so uh, basically, I, there, I'll, I'll give you one, one quick, uh, th this is a, a, a story that comes out of Buddhist, ancient Buddhist teaching actually. It's said that, a, that as Alexander was traveling out to the east to India, he met a Buddhist monk. And uh, this is a pretty famous story. You can go look it up online. Met a Buddhist monk, and the, he, uh, he was a, supposedly a f philosopher, according to um, uh, Alexander the Great, regarded him as a philosopher. And stopped and said, I want to hear some philosophy from this wise man or something like this. And so pressed him. And so the, this uh, Buddhist philosopher came up to him and he said, um, well, how did you get here, Alexander? And he said, well, I came by this chariot. 
He said, no, you didn't. He said, of course I did. You see it right here in front of me. And he said, well, where is its chariotness? And you could feel the pause in the text. He tried to describe what's there. And, well, it's got this and that. And, and it, the conclusion of it is basically that the chariotness is in, is in the person's mind. There's nothing inherently or essentially chariot-like about this particular configuration of jumbled things that were put together with a wheel and, and this kind of construct. And so the same thing can go with, like they would say with a, tr a chair, you know, you ask, you know, where is its chairness? Well, it's a construct in our minds. There's nothing inherently chair about a chair. It's, that's it's something that we carry around in our minds about this particular configuration of glue and wood and whatever's there. And so uh, the same thing goes with, with anything in terms of cognition. Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher at Cambridge uh, in prior generations, gave the famous analogy of the game. And basically in that he's trying to say, he's teaching a very important point here. He's saying, how do you define a game? What are the essential defining elements of a game? What is it that every game has in common? Tell me. And there really isn't any answer to that because no matter what you, he's got you there because no matter what you answer, oh, it's got players. Okay, well, he'll, he'll come up with an example where there aren't any. You know, oh, it's got winning. He'll come up with an example where no one wins. You know, you know, in every particular, you know, no matter what you come up with in terms of what a game is, you end up with there's a there's a counterexample. And so what you so basically, then how does the tradition of the game when you're creating a new game? How do you know it's a game? What is its gameness? And so basically, you have to rely on this cluster of variously recurring ideas that may or may not be present in every permutation of what a game is. Mm -hmm. But there's enough there to know, okay, that's a game. I know what a game is. We just got out of board, there's dice. I know what's going on here. I'm, I'm gonna categorize this as a game. Okay, we don't have any problem with that in terms of mental cognition. In fact, that's kind of the genetic work of our natural environment anyway. That's how we're wired neurologically. When we see the species of something, when we see our own children, for instance, they're like us, but they're not precisely us, mm -hmm. right? And so we get this argument oftentimes when it comes to the New Testament where uh, if Jesus doesn't match up on every single point all the way down the list, they throw out the comparison or that there was a mimetic genetic relationship, which is a stronger kind of idea there. They throw it out kind of out of hand. I think that's not only foolish, but it's reckless and vandalizes the discussion in so many ways. And so how there is no other way you would not expect jesus to line up precisely with each one of these just like in the garden variety examples that i give in chapter two none the of the greek and roman line they, up with each other precisely no each one has its own motifs and things and its own signals and but there are recurring themes that bubble up over and over again throughout them and uh but not none of them have all of them and so when we get to Jesus, yeah, he's got a cluster of eight or nine or whatever, but he doesn't have all 13. Well, eight or nine scoring very, very high on the list because some of those only have two or, or one, mm -hmm. but were correctly interpreted. And we know this from the text and interpreted by modern classicists correctly. Right. And so they're not confused about any of this and neither should we be. And so, yeah. This gets into an interesting uh, topic. I didn't know where this discussion would go, and that is the falsifiability of certain things. So people are approaching this going, they, they already are just going, nope, don't. I'm not interested. Nope, um, I'm not granting it. And then I even had a discussion with a well-known Christian apologist named Michael Jones. He has a pretty large Christian apologist audience, like 300,000 subscribers. And it was about, I would use this kind of, rhetoric it walks like a duck it talks like a duck it's a duck and him and the other christian apologists i talked to just kind of like they don't like that they make fun of it that i make that statement they're online like you know posts and stuff and they think it's funny i think it's funny that they make fun of it i think it's funny because they know that that duck is quacking and they know that it's walking and they know what i'm saying if it is the case it's a problem for what they're trying to conclude and it's more than a problem it's the end of it it's the end of it. So yeah. they go, a lot of them will go, ah, it's not walking like a duck. And even when they tried to bend over backwards, one of them went, 
Okay, so what? So let's just say that is the case. Well, what did you expect God to do? Like, wouldn't he want to make himself known by wa- working within the same fictive narrative of the rest of the world to reveal himself? And one of my buddies, Derek Bennett, your buddy too, was just kind of being humorous and said like, no, God of the universe, all powerful, couldn't come up with something new. He had to use the same fictive framework the rest of the uh, myths and legends were using. So one of my buddies who's kind of clever, uh, Caleb Jackson, in his response was like, well, how do you falsify something like that? Like Dennis McDonald's mimesis or your mimetic connections. Yeah. How can you falsify something like that? It seems almost like the, the subjective eye of the beholder can kind of just draw these parallels. And that's how they would consider them, just parallels. Yeah. Allison will show you can make a parallel almost out of anything. And therefore, it has no really bearing on the reality of the thing. You mentioned, though, we got something more than just parallel. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, well, first off, I think it's important to set up the framework. People talk about Hellenism. I don't really know your apologetic buddies. I, I'm completely out of that discussion at this point. Right. But to understand Hellenism, what was Hellenism? What are we talking about there? What did that mean? What was that? Um, I think it's troubling that you've got modern defenders of the religion that don't do the rigorous work to get back into those kind of questions. You know, you kinds of, it's sort of like, let's, let's start with our conclusions and run a beeline to how, or whatever, however fast we can erect an argument to defend it and bypassing all of the hard work that it would take to really understand what was going on in the ancient world. And to me, that's upsetting. I don't interface with that, but of course I, I want to give you my idea on that. So, Hellenism in the ancient world meant precisely the imitation of the Greeks. It didn't mean anything else. It never meant anything else. It was deliberate. We wanted to be like the Greeks. That's what the ancients thought. You know, we want to be like the Greeks. And so let's imitate them. And they did it in every possible way, in dress, in literature, in art, in architecture, Walls. in any number of ways. Yeah, in, in terms of how they, this, this was not just an influence as it's often perceived in, and portrayed in, in, uh, in specific writings in the field, this was a deliberate and intentional effort to become like the Greeks in terms of uh, working with their cultural capital. You could not have savoir faire, have cultural capital in the ancient world. The way that you expressed that or achieved it but was by your expression of Greekness. And so... This was deliberate. And so they would take on, they would take these texts and use them as part of their, uh, as, as, as how they, in terms of the ingredients in their recipes. Now it was new recipes in the Hellenistic world, but it was using the, these, these older prior ingredients. And so, um, how, how do you falsify that? I think it's a wrong headed question. Um, how do you falsify anything in terms of ancient language? If I were to give you the Greek lexicon, how do you falsify that any particular word in there meant this or that? Ployon meant boat. Well, how do we know that? With certainty. To what extent can we achieve certainty on that question? We, want, we can't teleport and, or time travel back into that world, so how do we know? Well, we look at many, many instances of the use of this word in, in relation to many other words that we're making a lot of assumptions about that are that are well established i'm not questioning that but the falsifiability of it how do you prove that you know how do you disprove uh, you know that ploy on that boat well you'd have to go and find all of these other but but you're not exhaustive so maybe in some context it did mean that or maybe it didn't you know so you end up with this kind of fuzziness that i think the theological certitude and dogmatism of the last century is driving and is kind of the bedrock of that. It's, it's this obsession with this kind of uh, rationalistic, um, how you say, approach to argumentation that really is divorced from the kind of scientific rigor that we would put on ancient language and cognition. How do you understand, for instance, a reference if you're watching a Pixar film to, uh, say, Star Wars or something like that, say in Shrek? You know, that, that's, it's kind of like a montage. If you go from beginning, beginning to end, there's, a, a multi, there's, there, there's different audiences that are meant for these kinds of films. You're, there's the children enjoying it at one level and adults enjoying it at another level and maybe, maybe even teens at another still. 
And some of these references and allusions, they're not lost in anyone in our culture because we are acculturated within this world. This is our contract as a people to understand and to understand how all of these different linguistic signals would have registered. That's our contract as participants in this world. And so in this, in this particular society. And so when you participate in a language, you are assenting to that contract in some ways. You're, par you're participating in a group collective mm -hmm. uh, understanding of what language means and how it works. And that was probably the most profound insight that Ferdinand de Saussure, the, the, the founder of, of structural linguistics, as we know it, linguistics and semiotic theory, that was his, I think, his most profound insight. And like so, if I was to get, move to Mexico or somewhere down in South America and I began to need to learn their language, not only will I learn some things about their language, but how it connects to their cultural aspects or like what they practice and, and their festivities, et cetera. Like even in their colloquial little discussions or whatever they might be having, there's some nuance to their particular language. And in Greek, the same is said about this Hellenism you, you're bringing us back mm -hmm. to. So this, you, you, you brought up Pixar and you brought up like modern fun fictional kid movies. And let's just say you said this one went to breakfast. It was, may the force be with you. Like, how do you falsify that that isn't actually a reference to Star Wars? What if he doesn't mean that? How do you know that that's exactly what he meant? You can't prove without a doubt with certainty that they're actually just trying to allude to Star Wars. Maybe they meant something else. Maybe there, maybe there's some subjective thing you can't peek behind their brain and they meant there's an actual force here and we're trying to say we hope that that force is with you. How do you know that this isn't a reference? Like, where do you draw the line? At some point, you got to go, okay, we're pretty, come on. That's Star Wars. Right. Well, when you see it's hard to kick against the goads, I mean, how do you falsify that and say Euripides, Bacchae, Dionysus? Right. When do you stop playing games and go, okay, this is definitely signaling Euripides or, or Romulus Ascension or whatever the example, Socrates' death, et cetera? Right, right. No, it's, it's supposed, and I think I've said this before, that the earliest Christians were either a blank slate or from some unimaginably alien place and now dropped into the major urban environments of the Greek East. And, and we're just finding all of this completely offensive and, and in, you know, <laughs> inexplicable and just avoiding even thinking about any of it. And it was not part of their, no, this is where they grew up. I don't know where you grew up, but I grew up in, in this culture. And there are a whole bunch of things that are part of that, that we all share in common. We know what cartoons are. We know what Bugs Bunny was. We know what Abraham Lincoln is. We know what, you know, the price of right is, you know, we know what, yeah, the price is right. We know, we know what all these different things are because we were bred in the, born and raised, reared in this culture. This is, this is our operating system, so to speak. Mm. And so they couldn't get rid, that wasn't erased when they, in fact, that operating system, the software of early Christianity was loaded onto that opera operating system and ran. Well, if, and I, so, if I might <laughs> pierce in here just to give you an idea of why I think they're asking this question, I think the reason the question gets asked is because they want this to be what actually happened. So when you're in the mindset of someone of apologetics, as you and I have both come from, we yeah. wanna think what we're reading is historically what happened, historiography again, which we're gonna get into the genre later in our episodes to deal with what's going on. But when you think something actually happened, in their mind, it's you're saying this signals myth, legend, story, mimetically in some way in the Greek world. I'm saying, I want this to happen. And in their mind, they kind of, the ones that are trying to be sophisticated and really wanna try and be as honest that I can see are going, Okay, well, what if it is Greek mimetic? Well, even if we grant that, it wouldn't seem to say that this didn't happen too. So they want to have the mimetic signal and historical what happened both. They want to eat their cake and have it too, right? That idea. Okay. So they want to go, well, just because it's mimetic doesn't mean that what's being mentioned here doesn't have historical memory or a kernel or actually happen. Okay. And that's troubling for me because when I'm reading Matthew, let's just go there. And I'm reading about Jesus in the wilderness being tempted for 40 days. I see Moses all over this. One can go, yeah, well, Jesus might have just like Moses decided to go out in the wilderness fast for 40 days and get tempted by Satan. And then he comes back and he's got this power of the Holy Spirit and he's overcome. And uh -huh. 
That sounds very fictive. Even Allison grants and goes like, mm, if there's a memory, it's just he was an exorcist. And I'm like, how do you know that? Like, I don't know how he can draw that conclusion from the story other than the fact that he has power over Satan. So casting out demons can be power over Satan. Somehow he, he interprets it that way. I don't see how you can do that. I personally just don't. That's a guess on his part, in my opinion. But I'm reading that and I'm going, how do you say this did happen? I mean... More right. likely this didn't happen to me than it did. And the same thing is happening with the Greeks. Like, it's more likely this is what's happening, is that it's mimetically signaling and drawing from what you're describing in your work. You would need better data to prove what it's saying actually did happen rather than it didn't. Right. No, you have to work against that. You'd have to work double time, really, to differentiate which is not what we're seeing happening in the earliest Christian writings. They're actually saying, no, we're actually dependent on that. They try to work with that and say, well, the prior antecedents or whatever, they were inspired by demons or something proleptically trying to upset what was the true, you know, and they mean true. And I mean, we need to bracket what they mean by that word a little bit. But what they're doing, though, is saying this is dependent on that in some way. We're not doing anything new here in terms of that. And then they try to, with you know, out of the other side of their mouth, try and discredit everything for it because it's 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 upsetting their project. But they kind of want both sides a little bit there. But at the same time, though, they're not creating a historiological argument. Right. That's that's not there. And so they're creating more of a rhetorical argument. Oh, it's demons. It was just assertions that they're making. They're not getting down to any any kind of hard evidential argument. And so. Uh, yeah, I think that basically you'd have to work again. It'd be kind of like if I were to find up in my grandfather's attic, say, some of his writings, and I pulled out a piece of paper there just out of nowhere. And, uh, oh, grandpa wrote something. Let me read it. And it says something about, I just read a few lines out of it. and says something about, and, uh, and the man had a cape on, came out of a telephone booth and flew into the air to fight crime or whatever, you know. How many words into that would it take for me to recognize that as a superhero trope? You know, I, I have no difficulty in that at all. Can I give you an example you brought up too? It's like a guy who says, I'm going to accurately give you, others have taken into account this and I'm going to write a better gospel. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 11 of that same opening, you have angels flying everywhere. It's like, how historically reliable is this? Yeah, no, we're not getting rigorous there. I mean, right. he, he says uh, the impeccable eyewitness account. And that's it's it's kind of tacked on as a jewelry item at the beginning and then not care, not given any serious treatment throughout the rest of Luke. And so it's it doesn't compare with the uh, proemium of the the prologues of any of the major history works that we know of it's this little tiny blip at the beginning it's not, it kind of reminds me of the blair witch project or something like that just kind of just this mockery almost of the genre but then at verse 11 you've got angels flying around with not the slightest thought of trying to you know uh, you know uh, discuss the implausibility of that being, you know, the case or any kind of uh, alternate accounts. There's no critical weighing of evidence. Now that none of that's going on, no, there, you don't see any of the kind of rigor that you would expect, you know, in the hallmarks of an ancient historiographical work. Mm. And so it, you're sort of just immersed. Um, you, you're, you're, the reader must have been favorably, it was expected to be favorably biased to these stories, with densely immersed in this kind of myth and folk belief and, and tradition within a cultic environment, not within an archival, you know, historiographical kind of context, at, like, say, the Library of Alexandria or something like that. You know, this is not the context where these, these documents would have circulated. So for the audience who's watching, stay tuned. Of course, thanks for supporting us on the Patreon but we're actually going to get on to what I would think is a way of falsifying the historical point of view um, as we go on into genre and various other discussions later with Dr. Miller. Because what, what they're asking for, I think we can give them their answer, what they're looking for. But it's a matter of dealing with what is this material? What is this? How do we, how we approach the New Testament is going to change how we're trying to conclude about it. And I think if we can get it fitted in its proper genre or at least its proper context mm -hmm. and, and situated by looking heuristically at all of the different genre, which is your critique of Litwa saying a new category just spawned out of nowhere. And here it is. We're going to get into that later in these episodes. Thank you. 
Thanks. I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe. And never forget, we are Miss Vision.